Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Dreamcatcher by Stephen King. So this was actually a buddy read with Stacey's stories, and I will link to her channel below if my neighbour doesn't fall through the roof and kill us all. I'm going to read you the blurb and then we'll take a look at some of the tabs I've got here. So, from the imagination of the world's best-selling writer, Dreamcatcher, in Derry, Maine, four young boys once stood together and did a brave thing, something that changed them in ways they hardly understand. A quarter of a century later, the boys are men who have gone their separate ways, though they still get together once a year to go hunting in the northwoods of Maine. But this time is different. This time a man comes stumbling into their camp, lost, disoriented, and muttering about lights in the sky. Before long, these old friends will be plunged into the most remarkable events of their lives as they struggle with a terrible creature from another world. Their only chance of survival is locked in their shared past, and in the dream catcher. So, right off the bat, the blurb kind of reminded me of it, in the, it being about is set around Derry, Maine, and with some you know group of friends who reunite in their in their adulthood, I guess. But it, it isn't really like it. Other than that, it's mostly you know an alien story. I thought this was interesting. The uh, the stranger that comes in. Uh, so Jonesy's looking at this stranger, and it says the comforter tumbled off him, and Jonesy saw he had a pretty good pot belly pooching out the front of his sweater. Well, he thought, nothing strange about that, at least. It's the middle-aged man's disease, and it's going to kill us in our millions during the next 20 years or so. Which is pretty prescient, you know, considering the obesity epidemic that we have. I thought this was a great quote here as well. So, um, it says here, Henry had talked with Jonesy a lot about his accident. Listened, really. Therapy was creative listening. I thought this was interesting here. So, um, they have a car accident, and Henry says, unbuckle your belt, Pete. Pete fumbled but couldn't seem to find it even though it was right in front of him. Working carefully, with not the slightest feeling of impatience, he supposed he might be in shock. Henry unclipped the belt and Pete thumped to the roof, his head bending sideways. Well, that's interesting because they do say quite often, especially in like plane crashes and stuff, people forget that they've not got a seat belt and they can't remember how to unhook the belt that's around them, you know, because they panic. I thought this was quite a cool thing. So one of the things about these alien creatures is that they really smell. Um, and it says, uh, no answer. And then she let loose with another of those long buzz saw farts, her face wrinkling up as she let go, as if it hurt her. And probably it did. Something that sounded like that just about had to hurt. And even though Pete had been careful to get upwind, some of the smell came to him, hot and rank, but somehow not human. Nor did it smell like cow farts. He'd worked for Lionel Sylvester as a kid. He'd milked more than his share of cows. And sometimes they blew gas at you while you were on the stool, sure. A heavy green smell, a marshy smell. This wasn't like that, not a bit. This was like, well, like when you were a kid and got your first chemistry set, and after a while we got tired of the faggy little experiments in the booklet and just went hog wild and mixed all that shit together just to see if it would explode. And he realised that was part of what was troubling him, part of what was making him nervous. Except that was stupid. People didn't just explode, did they? Still, he had to get him a little help here, because she was giving him the willies big time. And this character, uh, <laughs> this is a really bad lesson that, that he's been taught as a child, but... Um, he says, silence gives consent. That's what Mrs. White always used to say back in the fourth grade. Why was Mrs. White teaching the children that silence equals consent? I thought this was interesting. This was um, talking about cancer. And it says, uh, you know, certain patients who are schizophrenic with intestinal cancer. Always that smell, a friend had told Henry when Henry tried to describe it. They can brush their teeth a dozen times a day. Use lavaris every hour on the hour. And that, st and that smell still comes through. It's the smell of the body eating itself. Because that's all cancer is when you take the diagnostic masks off. Auto-cannibalism. This bit really made me laugh here as well. The, the choice of words that this guy goes with. Uh, Beaver screamed again, wriggled toward the door on his belly, then lurched up onto all fours, trying to shake the thing off. The muscular rope between his legs squeezed again, and there was a low popping sound from somewhere in the liquid haze of pain that was now his groin. Oh Christ, the Beaver thought. Mighty Christ bananas. I think that was one of my balls. Mighty Christ bananas. I thought this was interesting to, um, again, talking about cancer. And She sat down beside him, captured the restlessly whipping head and held it to her bosom. Even now, in his agitation, his skin was cool. His exhausted, dying blood could bring no heat to his face. She remembered reading Dracula long ago, back in high school. The pleasurable terror that had been quite a bit less pleasurable when she was in bed, the lights out, her room filled with shadows. She remembered being very glad there were no real vampires. She remembered being very glad there were no real vampires, except now she knew different. There was at least one, and it was far more terrifying than any Transylvanian count. His name wasn't Dracula, but leukemia, and there was no stake you could put through his heart. So this bit dates it here a little bit. It was published in 2001, um, 
And basically they're hearing res uh, messages over the radio and they're coming through in the voices of like well-known people. So the, he goes here, um, in case you wonder, the first voice is Sarah Jessica Parker, an actress. The second is Brad Pitt. Who's he? An actor. Uh-huh. Like, who, who, I mean, I guess maybe in 2001 you might have been less likely to have known Brad Pitt. But definitely today, I think everybody would know Brad Pitt. Oh, there he is. I was going to say, you guys can't see me, but Biggie's here. Oh, he's coming to sit here. So let's, let's let him join in on the action, shall we? Yeah? Good boy. Okay, what have we got next? So moving into part two of Dreamcatcher. So I'm going to read some of this. This is, a, there's a general in it called Kurt, um, who is obviously, the name is from like Apocalypse Now and Heart of Darkness as well, which we'll come to later. But he does a lot of uh, these like morale building speeches. So I'm going to read you this section here. I'm not a talker, boys. Talking's not what I do. But I want you to know that this is not, repeat, not a case of what you see is what you get. What you see is about six dozen grey, apparently unsexed humanoids standing around naked as a loving god made them, and you say, some would say anyway, why, those poor folks, all naked and unarmed, not a cock or a cunt to share among them, pleading for mercy there by their crashed intergalactic trailways, and what kind of a dog, what kind of a monster could hear those pleading voices and go in just the same? And I have to tell you, boys, that I am that dog. I am that monster. I am that post-industrial, post-modern, crypto-fascist, politically incorrect, male cocker rocker war pig, praise Jesus. And for anyone listening in, I am Abraham Peter Kurtz, USAF retired, serial number 241771699. And I am leading this charge. I'm the Lieutenant Collie in charge of this particular Alice's Restaurant Massacre. He took a deep breath, eyes fixed on the hovering helicopters. But fellows, I'm here to tell you that the Grey Boys have been messing with us since the late 1940s, and I have been messing with them since the late 1970s, and I can tell you that just because a fellow comes walking towards you with his hands raised saying I surrender, that doesn't mean, praise Jesus, that he doesn't have a pint of nitroglycerin shoved up his ass. Now the big old smart goldfish who go swimming around in the think tanks, most of those guys say the Grey Boys come when we started lighting off atomic and hydrogen bombs, that they came to that the way bugs come to a bug light. I don't know about that. I am not a thinker. I leave the thinking to others. Leave it to the cabbage. Cabbage got the head on him, as the saying goes. But there's nothing wrong with my eyes, fellows. And I tell you, those grey boys sons of bitches are as harmless as a wolf in a hen house. We have taken a good many of them over the years, but not one has lived. When they die, their corpses decompose rapidly and turn into exactly the sort of stuff you see down there, what you lads call Ripley fungus. Sometimes they explode. Got that? They explode. The fungus they carry, or maybe it's the fungus that's in charge, some of the think tank goldfish believe that might be the case, dies easily enough unless it gets on a living host. I say again, living host. And the host it seems to like the best fellows, praise Jesus, is good old Homo Sape. Once you've got it as much under the nail of your little finger, it's Katie bar the door and Homer run for home. This was not precisely the truth, not precisely anywhere near the truth as a matter of fact, but nobody fought for you as ferociously as a scared soldier. This Kurtz knew from experience. Boys, our little grey buddies are telepathic and they seem to pass this ability on to us through the air. We catch it even when we don't catch the fungus, and while you might think a little mind reading could be fun, the sort of thing that would make you the life of the party, I can tell you what lies a little farther down that road. Schizophrenia, paranoia, separation from reality, and total, I say again, total fucking insanity. The think tank boys, God bless them, believe that this, telep believe that this telepathy is relatively short acting right now. But I don't have to tell you what could happen in that regard if the grey boys are allowed to settle in and be comfortable. I want you fellows to listen to what I'm going to say now very carefully. I want you to listen as if your lives depended on it, alright? When they take us, boys, say again, when they take us, and you all know there have been abductions, most people who claim to have been abducted by aliens are lying through their asshole neurotic teeth. But not all. Those who are let go have often undergone implants. Some are nothing but instruments, transmitters perhaps, or monitors of some sort. But some are living things which eat their hosts, grow fat and then tear them apart. These implants have been put in place by the very creatures you see down there, milling around all naked and innocent. They claim there's no infection among them, even though we know they're infected right up the yin yang and the old wazoo and everywhere else. I've seen these things at work for 25 years or more, and I tell you, this is it. This is the invasion. This is the Super Bowl of Super Bowls, and you fellows are on defence. They are not helpless little ETs, boys, waiting around for someone to give them a New England telephone card so they can phone home. They are a disease. They are cancers, praise Jesus. And boys, we're one big hot radioactive shot of chemotherapy. Do you hear me, boys? I thought that was a cracking speech. We have a reference here to Jonesy's good friend, Hercule Poirot, he of the little grey cells. Which I enjoyed as a as I am a Poirot fan, you know. I like this thing as well where they're kind of conversing with the aliens, I guess. 
A terrible thought occurs to him then. For a moment it's so strong he is unable to resist the force moving him toward the bed. Then his feet begin to move again, leaving big red tracks behind him. You're not going to drink my blood, are you? Like a vampire. The thing in the bed smiles without smiling. We are, so far as I can express it in your terms, vegetarians. Yay, Team Vegan! So here we go, we have a throwback to um, Apocalypse Now. Perlmutter had read Heart of Darkness, had seen Apocalypse Now, and had on many occasions thought that the name Kurtz was simply a little too convenient. He would have bet $100, a great sum for a non-wagering artistic fellow such as himself, that it wasn't the boss's real name, that the boss's real name was Arthur Holzapple or Dagwood Elgart, maybe even Paddy Maloney. Kurtz? Unlikely. I think this is great as well, so someone falls down, it says, but halfway to a couple of semi-trailers that had been pushed together, his feet flew out from beneath him and he went on his ass. The clipboard he'd been carrying went sliding like a toboggan for leprechauns. Thought that was just a great little piece of imagery. Then this bit's interesting as well because this has happened before. It happened in Black House where a character was kind of possessed and forced to stab themselves in the hand with a pen. This is a little different, but I wonder whether the fact that this has happened twice now, whether this is King's take on the pen being mightier than the sword. So, Jones saw his hand shoot out and up to the driver's side visor. His hand gripped the ballpoint pen and yanked it free, snapping the rug rubber band which held it. No, Jenna shouted, but it was too late. He caught a shiny zipping glitter as his hand, which was gripping the ballpoint like a dagger, plunged the pen into his staring eye. There was a popping sound and he jittered back and forth behind the wheel like a badly managed puppet, his fist digging the pen in deeper and deeper, up to the halfway mark, then to the three-quarter mark, his split eyeball now running down the side of his face like a freakish tear. The tip struck something that felt like skin gristle, bound up for a moment, then passed through into the meat of his brain. So we're talking about how exactly the, the kind of alien virus works here, and it says, uh, Here's the instant replay, so pay attention. Point one, the greys, probably no more than delivery systems for the virus, are gone already. The ones the environment didn't kill, like the microbes finally killed the Martians in War of the Worlds, were wiped out by your gunships. All but one, that is. This one. The one, yeah, must be, that I got my information from. And in a physical sense, he's gone too. So I just like that little, uh... Reference to War of the Worlds. And then he continues. Point two, the weasels don't work. Like all cancers, they ultimately eat themselves to death. The weasels that escape from the lower intestine or the bowel quickly die in an environment they find hostile. Point three, the virus doesn't work either. Not very well. But given a chance, given time to hide and grow, it could mutate, learn to fit in, maybe to rule. Terrifying thought. And then we have this little bit here, which I'm going to read out to you, but I just wanted to show you as well because it's pretty sinister. Okay, and so that says... To those lost in the storm, May 31st, 1985, and to the children, all the children, love from Bill, Ben, Bev, Eddie, Richie, Stan, Mike, the Losers Club. Spray painted across it in jagged red letters, also perfectly visible in the truck's headlights, was this further message. Pennywise lives. Dun dun dun. I actually got sort of chills when I read that. So I thought this was interesting. The army then sort of starts to, I guess, wage war on people um, to stop this thing from spreading, you know? So we get this bit here. A hundred miles north of Kurtz's position, and less than two miles from the junction of back roads where Henry had been taken, the new commander of the Imperial Valleys, a woman of severe good looks in her late forties, stood beside a pine tree in a valley which had been codenamed Clean Sweep One. Clean Sweep One was, quite literally, a valley of death. Piled along its length were heaps of tangled bodies, most wearing hunter orange. There were over a hundred in all. If the corpses had ID, it had been taped around their necks. The majority of the dead were wearing their driver's licenses, but there were also Visa and Discover cards, Blue Cross cards and hunting licenses. One woman with a large black hole in her forehead had been tagged with a blockbuster video card. Standing beside the largest pile of bodies, Kate Gallagher was finishing a rough tally before writing her second report. In one hand she held a Palm Pilot computer, a tool that Adolf Eichmann, that famous accountant of the dead, would certainly have envied. And Eichmann... He was like the architect of the final solution during the Holocaust, which is actually really strange because I'm currently watching World War II in colour as well. I thought this was interesting as well. So we've got Duditz, who is the character who has kind of learning disability. And it says, uh, although his mind reading ability was fading rapidly as, as his body beat back the virus, Owen, wondered, Owen understood this easily enough. Beaver sent to me, Duditz said, for my Christmas last week. Down sufferers had difficulty expressing concepts of time past and time to come, and Owen suspected that to Duddits the past was always last week, the future always next week. It seemed to Owen that if everyone thought that way, there would be a lot less grief and rancour in the world. So there we have it, that's everything I kind of wanted to share with you from Dreamcatcher by Stephen King. All in all, I really enjoyed the story. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for alien stuff as well, and King, you know, he's really good at writing that kind of thing. It's kind of similar to the Tommyknockers, I actually like the Tommyknockers as well. Um... 
This one possibly edges it out just because the characters in this are so like iconic to me at least. Like they've felt very real and very fleshed out. Whereas with the Tommy Knockers, maybe the characters not so much, but the storyline I think I found more interesting, I guess. But overall, yeah, I did enjoy it. I gave it a four out of five and would recommend. And thank you as well to Stacy's Stories for buddy reading this with me. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Dreamcatcher by Stephen King. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.